podcast number 25. Let's go! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your Bedroom Super Producer podcast. We are your hosts. My name is JT. And I'm BK. And today, BK, we're re-venturing into the world of TV, movie, music. And uh, we have a very, very um, special subject today, or should I say uh, a composer who we are going to uh, dissect, analyze, study, and uh, who do I have in mind? Uh, this week, uh, we're talking about a composer, a uh, conductor, record producer from that special Swedish school of music. We're talking about none other than Ludwig Emil Thomas Goransson. Oh, yes. And uh, to start things off, how did you first hear of uh, Ludwig Goransson? I think I didn't know it was him. I think the first time I heard of him was probably uh, when he worked with uh, Danny Glover. Yep. Uh, right? Uh, so I think it was probably for one of his first songs. Uh, I think it was uh, for This Is America. I think that, that was yep. the first time that I heard of him. But I think I might have known of him like from way back, I think, when he uh, he helped other pro uh, composers write music, but I didn't quite um, like made made the connection. And it's really, really ap even afterwards when I listened to uh, the soundtracks that he made, Black Panther, um, I didn't really make the connection between the fact that he was a record producer and also he was making soundtracks. So I kind of, I kind of took some time to put it all together and to realize how uh, multifaceted he was. Multifaceted is really, I think, the key word for today because Goransson really has uh, a unique depth and breadth to his work. I mean, like you said, he's both, you know, working with, you know, rap artists such as uh, Childish Gambino and Travis Scott and all these guys. But he also does some of uh, the most... I mean, I'll even go as far as saying influential movie scores right now or, or, or TV. I mean, I'll put those two together because to me, scoring a, a TV show is pretty much the same as scoring a movie. Sometimes it's just the, the, the size of the budget that changes. Yeah, so for me, it was really uh, that... Uh, that wink to, to Bootsy Collins and, and, and uh, Parliament, or is it Funkadelic? I always get those two mixed up. But when he uh, produced the, the first Childish Gambino album and there was the song Redbone on there, I was like, wow, like that's, that's such a vibe. I, I, I really, need, and uh, when that happens, I always go on Wikipedia and figure out who the producer is. And from there, you know, I'll, I'll YouTube him and or her and uh, Google some more to really know everything there is to know about that particular artist. And, uh, and, and sure enough, I found this video on uh, YouTube where he, uh, he explains exactly the process, the instruments that uh, were used to create Redbone, uh, which is to me, like, it really has that classic funk vibe. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting because... Uh, even in the interviews that I, I listened to uh, to prepare for this show, um, you see that he he admits of not being well versed in sometimes uh, all the all the things that he tries to make. And uh, I always found that fascinating. Usually, composers and producer they 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 usually first they evolve in a specific jar. So they have the history down, they've been listening to it, they have the vinyl collections, they've been working, let's say, on the MPC, they've been sampling for years and years, or they have a specific history that brings them to a specific place where they're kind of the masters of what they do and they kind of get discovered or they do that for a specific artist. And for him, it's kind of the say the opposite. He 
he discovers things and he makes new music with new artists and he educates himself to be able to 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 write that specific type of music that he think is going to sound best with that artist and for for me i respect that in a in a composer the way that you're always evolving always learning from new mus- musicians and always learning new techniques and uh, like for him like he says that he wasn't when he produced for uh, childish gambino he wasn't necessarily in that whole uh, f- parliament and funkadelic and everything but he learned about it and he he found a way to incorporate it in the the producing that he did uh, for that record yeah and i i mean He's really like, uh, and I don't want this to sound negative, but he's like the greatest jack of all trades of all times, in a way. Because, like, as you said, when he started to work on the on the uh, Childish Gambino LP, he wasn't so familiar with like American '70s funk, and yet he produces like a track that could have well uh, been on one of those classic records, like both in terms of songwriting and in terms of, you know, mixing and getting all of the sonics right. So that's really, really unique. And I don't, I don't think, and that's why I, I wanted us to talk about him today, is the fact that um, I don't think we've ever seen a producer who could do this. Like, he can literally write in any genre uh, and, and get the sonics right, whether it be, you know, hip-hop for, for stuff like uh, the... the the Kevin Hart and the the Rock movie, what, what, was it a CIA or something? No, Central Intelligence. Central Intelligence. And yeah. then, and then he can go on to produce those massive hybrid scores, uh, like uh, the Hollywood cliche right now with Venom. And then he goes way left field with old Americana slash Western music for the Mandalorian. So. It's really all over the map, and every time he does that, he he still finds a way to master that per- specific style. Yeah, uh, totally true. Um, well, I think I was I was reading an interview uh, with him, and he said that uh, one of the reasons that he's able to do that is that he went into uh, movie scoring because, uh, kind of like Hans Zimmer, he says that he he felt that movie scoring was a way to be able to always first reinvent yourself and to be able to do any type of music you want. Because usually when you're just a producer, you kind of find your your niche or something, be it hip hop, be it jazz, be it um, whatever, contemporary, whatever, classical or anything. And then you kind of have to stay there and people don't quite get what you're trying to do if you move out of the, the jazz genre or if you're not pop enough or... Uh, to, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but and he he thought that if he would do if he could do film scoring, then you have pretty much uh, any leeway you want. You know, well, of course, you have the stress of having to to produce a whole ton of music for a movie, which is like it's very very difficult, as we we covered it with uh, John Williams uh, in the past. But at the same time, you have the opportunity to do anything you want, and uh, like Hans Zimmer said in an interview that he did with. Uh, with the Goranson, he said that if you wanted to do a Western uh, metal uh, violin with distortion type of soundtrack, I'm sure you can find someone who has a script that can fit that uh, that specific type of music that uh, you're trying to do. So I think it's not um, uh, it's 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 normal for him to be able to. To be able to branch out like this, because I think it's always been his plan to be, to to always reinvent himself and to not always be pigeonholed into a specific type of music. Yeah, I mean that's a very good point that you brought. The fact that with movie or TV music, there's always someone out there who has an idea who could complement this weird eclectic uh, mixture that you're trying to come up with. Whereas if you're an artist, it might be more difficult to convey the public, you know, this weird marriage of sounds that you're trying to come up with. But yeah, I mean, uh, for me, Goranson, really, like, I was fascinated with the whole hip hop stuff that he came up with. And it was only actually when The Mandalorian came out that I realized that he had been doing TV and movie stuff for quite a while. Yeah, he he was doing... uh... 
uh, the community TV show. I don't know if you know that yeah. that series. I knew the I, series, actually, but that's I, the I, thing. I didn't. I, I've never seen the series. I, I heard bits and pieces of the music he did for it uh, on YouTube, but other than that, I... Uh, Which is totally different from the movies and totally different from what he does for rap artists. So it's uh, incredible. What kind of music is it? Like, what's the palette on Community? I heard some oh, it's, like soft guitar it's, stuff. It's really but... like soft guitar, like TV series, emotional, like soft acoustic stuff. Uh, it's right. really totally different than when he does it uh, elsewhere it's uh yeah there's it's, it's, a it's interesting there's a, a very interesting score i also heard on spotify i uh, haven't seen the movie it's called everything everything it kind of has that same vibe but it's really you know in the rom-com uh realm you can f easily fall for cliches but, but yet he comes up with a way to do it uh That's really interesting. The way he makes clusters out of, you know, obviously other instruments than strings is really unique, I think. He did it on The Mand Mandalorian with the, the recorders, did it on the Community a bit also with the, uh, the, the acoustic guitar stuff. And he really has this unique way of like piling up little snippets of music and, and, and creating those like drone all, almost uh textures and i really like that from uh his movie stuff and so let's talk about uh some of our favorite projects from him and uh analyze a bit of uh like the way he writes the music and produces it which w what strikes you most from his work um my favorite ultimate favorite was probably black panthers that was my favorite uh, of his project uh second mandalorian And I'm still waiting to really savor the soundtrack for Tenet, the new uh, Chris Chris Nolan movie that's supposed to be coming yeah. out soon. That's I'm really waiting for that one because I feel it's going to be a uh, epic. I can't wait to see exactly what he. I think we we've had teasers in the, in the trailers. I think there's part of the trailers that's it's his music, but can't we can't be really sure. I think he also worked with. Um, With Travis Scott on a track for that movie, also, but uh, he did. So I just want to. I heard. Uh, I want to put all the these tracks together and listen to it. Uh, it's gonna be. It's gonna be epic. Uh, yeah, but, for sure. But my number one, probably Black Panthers. I think the work he did on that movie was incredible. Um, the way he found to just to marry all these different styles, and the way he found to to use that like old school uh that sound from africa and to mix it with the big band the big say london like london orchestra like john williams type of things for the epic superhero things but still keeping that that uh how, how do i call it uh that lion king vibe that <laughs> that hans zimmer used to used to do in his movies um I think also, once again, to show that he's a guy who likes learning, he knew he couldn't pull this off just in his studios in front of his computer. He actually went to Senegal to work with local musicians to to follow um, really famous uh, musicians, uh, like the old way of, like, I think he followed uh, Baba Mal, who's a pretty popular uh, uh, Senegalese uh, singer followed him on tour he recorded his musicians at his studio and all those demos and scratch demos became the basis for the black panther uh soundtrack and he used all those those talking drums and all the the, the local stuff that we never hear uh, in movies these days usually it's either electronic music and an orchestral and he just married those ethnic sounds with new uh with orchestral sounds with electronics with synth um i think there's a track where he mixed some talking drums with an with an 808 rhythm like the fight scenes and uh and black panthers which is totally awesome you see kind of the the hip-hop influence that he kind of put back in his uh in his score uh so it's uh like for me that was the the his most epic soundtrack and he actually won uh an oscar for that soundtrack Indeed. I think he also won... Uh, so wait, 
Academy Award. Is that uh, is that Oscar? Yeah, yeah. So he won that, and he also won a a, a Grammy for the same same project. I think no. Uh, no, Grammy was uh, for Childish Gambino for song of the uh, song album of the year and song of the year for This Is America. No, he won he won Grammy Award for best score or soundtrack on the Black Panther uh, movie also. Really? I'm, uh, I'm looking at the the wiki. Yeah. Okay. I yeah, always... so he won he won both in the same year for Black wow. Panther, wow. so it, I remember just the Oscar. Yeah, that, so that's quite something too. Like I, I don't know of anyone else that won both the same year for the same project. It's, yeah. Uh, I guess he got the industry's attention from there. Yeah, I think now he's uh, he's the secret weapon of many uh, many uh, directors and producers. Yeah, and going back to the the Tenet movie, I was uh, on his uh, Instagram this morning, and you can actually hear excerpts from the the Travis Scott uh, collabo. And uh, wow, all I can say was like, why is it just thirty seconds long? Give me more, give me more. So it's it's always a good sign when the, the teaser gives you that uh, that eagerness to hear the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think uh, he's gonna soon hit his stride also because he's he's still quite young i mean for doing all of that stuff that's another thing that's quite amazing to be like 35 36 and taking on anything and everything and succeeding at pretty much anything he touches it's uh the you know i was trying to come up with anyone that did something quite like this and the only guy i could come up with was quincy you know yeah, indeed doing both the movie the arranging the the the, the pop sessions and and uh, being successful at all of these things, I mean, who else? Who else dabbled in both the pop world and the not many and the movie people. world? Like I said, not many people. I think he's one of the him with Quincy. He's one of the only ones who, who's able to to be a chameleon like that and uh, to be well versed in different multiple genres to be able to do that and to be successful. But I think he was uh, he was. First, he was a great musician at uh, from the start. I think he started very early uh, learning guitar and learning instruments. Um, I thought I think I saw an interview that says that he he conducted, he wrote his first piece of music for a, a big orchestra. I think in his high school band or the, the beginning of college or something. He was like seventeen, and he he said that that that's what drew him into composing because when he heard those 80 people playing his music it was like like a magical moment um i thought i think he was also lucky because he went to study at usc in california and that's where he met uh ryan coogler yeah and ryan coogler which is the director for uh black panther um all the creed creed movies um so i think that's kind of and he's been working with him for the past 10 to 12 years. So I think they both kind of used each other to climb the ladder and they've been working together ever since. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, uh, it's, it's really the secret to success in movie scoring. When you, uh, when you have this special partnership with a director, uh, exactly. it shows. Exactly. When it you, shows. When you don't get the script like uh, two days before recording and when you can get the script six months ahead and do your research and... Uh, go and uh, go to Africa and study uh, different with different musicians and find sounds and record sounds. So, yeah, but yeah, you're totally right. For a 35 year old to have uh, Oscars and Grammys and uh, produce in hip hop and write scores like that, it's uh, very impressive. Let's uh, let's talk about his process a bit. You said that uh, he's a great musician, so he learned, um, I guess, on a college level. Uh, jazz guitar uh i think he went uh, to the royal college of music in stockholm uh, i think it was jazz guitar i think that was what he was doing at the, the beginning of his career seeing some of the like the studio footage one thing that i found really interesting is the fact that uh when he gathers these huge palettes of sounds let's say when he was working on black panther he recorded all of these talking drums players and the the Baba Mal vocals and all of that. And then he comes back to his studio. And uh, I like the fact that he uses Ableton Live to come up with like the grooves, you know, clean up all of his loops and, and or actually create loops out of all of the recordings. 
But then he transfers those into DP, digital performer, yeah. to work on the image. Yeah, yeah. I think um, knowing from the past, because uh, we've worked, uh, we worked with DP in the past, uh, DP is very well adapted to scoring to picture. There's a tons of there's a lot of of great tools inside in terms of syncing, in terms of project management, in terms of recalling uh, like special sessions with special settings with that fit with all your inputs and outputs from your sound cards so that you can work more efficiently. And I think that if you aside from Pro Tools, that's kind of the, the like the the mainstream for pretty much everything. DP is something that's still used a lot by people who work on, on TV shows because TV shows, you have to compose a lot of music in a very short time. Usually for a, an episode, you have maybe four to five days to compose everything. So that's pretty a pretty short amount of time to compose everything and then to like throw it out to your arranger he puts it on the sheet music paper, arrange it for the orchestra, and then have like go into the session and conduct everything probably in a day, and uh, for it to, to be ready uh, for the episode. Uh, I think DP is very well adapted for that, and I think that's why he he works. And I don't know if you remember uh, um, Michael Giacchino before yep. being this great composer for Star Trek and everything. He used to work on the series Alias. Okay. Alias with Jennifer Gardner, that CIA spy stuff, uh, like back in the days. And he used to do pretty much the same type of work. Like, um, he would do an episode every week. Uh, and he also worked in DP. He said it was the easiest way to, to recall all your settings, to always be recalling every track, having every track ready with every plugin on it. It's easier than uh, any other DAW. Yeah, I, I, and I did hear him uh, in one of those like, l little studio interviews where he said that in DP he had, you know, templates for all of these projects, one for community or several for community and, and so on and so forth. So uh, indeed, there's a, so if people ask us, uh, what's the greatest DAW? Well, maybe that's the answer. What are we, what, what kind of music are you trying to, to make? Exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah. Uh, because obviously in the movie world, people uh, will gravitate towards either DP or Cubase. And then in the pop, electronic, hip-hop uh, stuff, mostly it's either Ableton or, or Fruity Loops. Or is it FL Studio now? Sorry. <laughs> and, and another thing that's really uh, interesting about his process is, uh, and we've mentioned that already, but is the fact that every big movie project that he has, he'll go out there... And, and, and find sounds, do some of his own sound design and Foley stuff, you know, for Creed, for example, he went to this boxing gym and created beats out of, you know, people hitting the, the heavy bags and then, you know, uh, doing some, some uh, jump rope stuff. And so I, found, I, I find that very uh, creative, you know, to, to go out there, immerse yourself into the, the sounds and smells and, 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 and ambiances of uh, whatever the subject matter of the project is and then coming up with musical ideas out of those building blocks yeah but it's a way to immerse yourself in the process to be uh, in the in the same room where either it's going to be filmed or either to get that mood that special combat mood or that training mood uh, for a, a boxing movie or something and it's it's a good way to put yourself in like in and uh, in, in what you're trying to portray, what you're trying to to process, the type of music uh, that you you want to create to give that special mood to the movie. So it's I don't think it's necessarily about getting exactly the same sounds that you would. It's just about immersing yourself in the process, kind of like reading the script. Sometimes you're asking yourself, why should you read the script? You're only writing the music. You should be writing pretty much to picture. But no, um, like what type of emotion you want to per you want to portray the, is it just about the sunset or is it about what the the characters are feeling during the sunset so it's it's all about like immersing yourself in and what the director 
wants to portray on, on screen. And I think he found a, a perfect way. Like I said, he's always willing to learn and to 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 put himself in a and always it's he's not always in a safe zone. I don't know if you've you you've noticed that. He always tried to put himself in kind of in a no man's land where he's kind of uncomfortable. Okay? Uh, I don't think many compose I don't think many composers would like to go to Africa and just start recording uh, people jamming on drums with polyrhythms that they don't understand. But he's willing to do it because he's like, oh, I've never heard this before. What's that all about? Usually they stick to to like pen like pen and paper like John Williams. He sticks to what he knows. He's you know he he's hired to do that type and he does that type. And he's kind of another generation. He he mixes electronics. He mixes uh, synthesizers. I think one of the things I loved uh, about doing the research for this episode is I don't know if you saw like when he uh, when he plays all the parts for the Mandalorian. It's 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 awesome that video you know he he plays that 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 tum the the, the tum drums on his drums and then he plays that funky that funky flute and he adds that uh, that synth guitar that special guitar that he can he that he plugs into his uh his modular rack and everything and it's it's awesome to see kind of the little snippets of how he did those uh, those little bits of sound cuz when you listen to it it sounds like a, i don't know western flutey uh, uh synth theme but when you see him do it you're like oh that's how he did it oh oh that's just a floor tom it's not like a a big orchestral thing it's it's just something in his studio oh it's just a, a small flute of i don't even know what type of flute he uses on that thing but it's uh it's awesome to see these producers in their environment just creating those sounds and it kind of demystifies the way they do it yeah, and I mean, I can totally relate with him when he says, you know, especially when he approached uh, the the Mandalorian project, he wanted to get away from the computer and, and just zone out with those flutes that he bought for the project. And uh, I mean, yeah, we, we all at some point face this uh, creative block where the computer offers so many tools and, uh, and options that sometimes you... You just want to go back to uh, something simple that uh, actually constrains your creativity. Because usually having less options makes you more creative, at least in my opinion. It, dep- it, it depends, but it's like, like you said, it's important to, to do both. Not always be in that, that universe where you can recall anything and use any synth and like have every single sound in the world at your disposal, every single sound bank. And you go back to a world sometimes to just, I don't know, recording the wind outside or recording the the leaves brushing on the on the tree leaves on the the tree branches or whatever, and that can be inspiring too. It can create like an awesome background. It could make you think of another idea. I think for for human beings, variety is important. You can't just get stuck into one thing and expect to be. Uh, super prolific and productive when you're always in front of the same canvas with the same colors with the same palette like like you said i think uh too much choice is just as paralyzing as not having enough absolutely and and you remind me with uh, saying all of this good stuff that uh going back to our billy eilish uh episode i still have to take my iPhone out there and just record random sounds just for my, uh, my own personal, uh, pleasure and uh, creating my own little bank of, uh, you know, textures and Foley and stuff that I could uh, potentially use, uh, in our projects. Good idea. So, um, to, uh, kind of close this, uh, really uh, cool discussion, um, where would you point, uh, our listeners to if they want to discover, uh, like a good starting point to discover Ludwig Göransson straight um, into Black Panther. I would say probably, probably three things. Like I said earlier, um, if you want something, if you're interested in like really like big scores from a big movie, go straight to Black Panther. Uh, if you want something a little bit different, a little bit more organic. Uh, the Mandalorian is a perfect place to start, and uh, and if you want 
more of on like his producing side and everything, I would say go listen to Childish Gambino and I think you you'll see his whole palette. I think how he he's able to to mimic uh, all the great stuff that we love about music in 2020. Yeah, great recommendations for me. I'll go a bit. Uh, <laughs> I'll come from the other direction and I'll say, go listen to Trolls World Tour. Oh yeah, that that, he, uh, uh, that soundtrack he did with uh, Justin Timberlake. Yeah, yeah. Well, him amongst a, a lot of A-listers. But what's really fascinating about that soundtrack is the fact that Goranson once again was able to create re like modern remixes or remakes of a lot of classic tracks. You know, from um, what's it again? Um, well, he has "Born to Die" there. And then that uh, Ozzy Osbourne one, Crazy Train. And so it just goes to show you again that uh, once you know music, you can pretty much do anything, whether it be, you know, hard rock from the 70s and 80s to, you know, modern funk, old school funk, disco. And so, uh, I mean, it might not be everyone's cup of tea, that Trolls soundtrack, but it really shows just how versatile and uh, overall good uh, he he just is you know yeah yeah well he's a he's a composer for me a composer can really branch out into many different things it's just that these days not many of them do aside from someone like uh, maybe Hans Zimmer who kind of he, he branches out uh, pretty much it's always it has that the, the, that same Hans Zimmer sound but he has a lot of like gypsy stuff and everything. Like we said earlier when we did the the, the podcast uh, with him, like the stuff that he did for Sherlock Holmes, that's pretty that's pretty out there. It's not very standard. So um, I think Goranson kind of, I think was inspired by uh, by guys like Williams, by guys like uh, Hans Zimmer to to become the person, and maybe even better than, than these guys in the way he uh, he's able to kind of take his talent and to make like everyone everyone use it from hip hop artists to scoring and to scoring for animation and to scoring for for kind of sport epic movies all the way to superheroes so it's he's a he's the new generation yeah i mean he he might not be quite there yet in terms of orchestration but he makes up for that definitely with like everything that he brings to the table. I mean, even Hans, I, I wouldn't say he's as uh, versatile as uh, Garanson. Like Hans does one thing better than anyone, but yeah, he did branch out a bit, but it still sounds like his movie soundtracks, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. As for, for, for Garanson, he can really definitely master a style and, and, and go with it for a project. Which is uh, again uh, truly, truly unique. I'm uh, I'm in awe actually of just how good the, the dude is. It's uh, it's really inspiring, really inspiring. Yeah. All right. So uh, bedroom producers out there, uh, this is uh, what we had for you guys today in terms of uh, triggering that uh, creative gene in you guys and uh, helping you uh, hear some new stuff, get inspired, maybe learn some techniques from these incredible human beings. And uh, on that note, I'm going to wish you a very, very creative, productive Sunday afternoon. I myself am uh, going out to uh, buy some gear. Isn't that right, BK? Well, indeed. Buying gear, that's, uh, that's a strange thing to do for yeah, us. I know. That's weird. I, I know, but sometimes I like to, you know, break out of the mold, do some, something weird. Spice it up a little bit. Exactly. Perfect. Well, I'm going to wish you luck in that that gear hunt of yours. And I'm going to wish all, all the listeners a great week, some great beats. Uh, don't forget to put 808s everywhere in your music as they sound awesome. And on that note, have a great week. Peace. Peace out, guys. Thanks for listening to the podcast, guys. Remember to subscribe if you like what you hear. We're on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube. Also, if you want to support us, head on to delicatebeast.com. You can find our serum packs, our contact instruments, 
and also plenty of freebies if you subscribe to the newsletter. Don't forget to follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and once again, keep making that awesome music.